Hello everyone, Nick the DM here, back with another comprehensive Planar Dragon video. This time I took a trip to the Plane of Shadow to bring you everything on the Shadow Dragon, so let's take a look. But before we do, I just want to say for the first time I have a subscriber goal. I would like to hit a thousand subscribers by the end of 2023, so if you haven't yet, please subscribe. Anyways, on to the lore. Shadow dragons are, as I mentioned in the intro, a type of planar dragon, which usually means that they are a type of true dragon native to a plane of existence other than the material plane. Shadow dragons can be found most commonly in the plane of shadow, otherwise known as the Shadowfell or Shadowlands or a few other names. They can also be found on the home of the draconic pantheon, Dragon Eyrie, and the material plane worlds of Toril and Kryn, according to the Dragons of Faerun and Dragons of Kryn supplement from 3.5e. Also, the 4th edition Draconomicon, Chromatic Dragons, mentions Shadow Dragons, which could mean that they can also be found on the world of Abir. The origin of shadow dragons is as shrouded as the gloom and shadows the creatures are surrounded by, remaining mostly a mystery even to other true dragons. That which is known varies, as I mentioned earlier, between the naturally born shadow dragons and those transformed into shadow dragons in one of a number of ways, which include some of the following. Necridian, the first shadow dragon known by the mortals of Kryn, appeared shortly after her chromatic cousins were absorbed by the dragon stones of the elven people. This mighty dragon was thought to have made a deal with Nuatari, the devouring dark or the dragonlance god of magic used for evil, to change her chromatic nature in exchange for her servitude to the devouring dark. But no known records can actually support this documented theory, though it is known that she joined the Third Dragon War at Nuatari's request, so fairly likely. In 39 AC, Alt Cataclius, or After Cataclysm, in the Dragonlance setting, the mage Fistandantilus summoned the shadow dragon Whisper from his apparent home on the Plane of Shadow to defend Zaman during the Dwarfgate Wars, which could be an example of a native-born shadow dragon from the Plane of Shadow. The Kryn shadow dragon Adumbrant's origin was apparently a mystery even to him as he claimed to remember nothing of his life before the gods returned at the end of the War of Souls. And the mysterious Chaos Shadow Dragon, which was created by the aspect of Chaos's manifestation on Kryn, was made from the spirits slain by its master and took draconic form in a mockery of the other gods' noble creations. Obviously, this is a special case, as this dragon was just formed into existence. It's just a neat mention. These are just a few notable examples. There are, of course, other well-known shadow dragons, but their origins align with the more usual and commonplace origins that I will detail now. Fourth edition lists shadow dragons as one of the few varieties of dragons native to the Shadowfell. Now, while there are many natural shadow dragons, other species of true dragons are capable of being transformed by years spent in the Shadowfell. The magical nature of dragons holds an attraction for the Shadowfell, which seems somehow to crave the might and majesty of these great reptiles. Portals to the Shadowfell can manifest in forlorn places and the deep gloom of subterranean caverns. Dragons that lair in such places where a portal has formed can discover these portals and find themselves transported to a new plane. Ancient dragons that sleep in their lairs for months or years at a time might be transported to the Plane of Shadow without even knowing a portal has formed while they dreamt. This next part isn't explicitly mentioned, it's just my personal thoughts, but ancient dragons that sleep for years could be completely transformed by the time they awaken, as the time it takes to transform into a shadow dragon is only described as, quote, the transformation to a shadow dragon happens over a period of years, end quote, and that comes from the 5th edition Monster Manual. Some shadow dragons end up embracing the Shadowfell for its bleak landscapes and desolation, Others seek to return to the material plane, eager to spread the darkness and evil of the plane of shadow. The Shadowfell also has a dispiriting effect on its denizens. The longer a creature remains on the plane, the more it accepts the plane's malaise. As months and years pass for a dragon on the Shadowfell, it becomes aware of the transformation being wrought upon it and yet can do nothing to prevent it. 
a transformed Shadow Dragon becomes so suffused with the power of the Shadowfell that even a return to the material plane can't undo its transformation. Only a true dragon can transform into a Shadow Dragon, and only if it's born in the Shadowfell or remains there for several years. This is according to 5th edition. Of course, there are some uh, obvious variations to how sh Shadow Dragons can be formed, as I mentioned earlier. According to 5th edition, a Draco Lich cannot be turned into a Shadow Dragon since it loses its draconic nature when it becomes undead, and a Shadow Dragon can't be transformed into a Draco Lich, for it has already lost too much of its physical form. However, in Monsters of Faerun 3rd edition, it is said that a number of Shadow Dragons have joined forces with the Cult of the Dragon, and at least two Shadow Draco Liches are known to be associated with the Cult. One specific example of a known Shadow Dragon Draco Lich is the ancient Orglarasa, the Sibilant Shade, who is one of the Shadow Dragons with ties to the Cult of the Dragon that I mentioned earlier. So the incompatibility mentioned in 5th edition may just be a balance issue with stat templates rather than a lore-specific reason, because they do canonically exist in earlier lore. Naturally born shadow dragons, of course, start as an egg. Shadow dragon eggs look white under normal daylight or yellowish torchlight, however, with white light behind the egg, a purple tinge can be seen within though this is a trait shared with amethyst and deep dragon eggs. Female shadow dragons lay eggs in clutches of 5 to 8 according to Monster Manual number 2 for, from 1st edition. These clutches are located in a dark place, and the first to hatch quickly devours the others. Shadow dragons are not known to have any specific mating rituals, but it is assumed that females possess at least some ability to lay eggs like other dragons. However, even if a female can find a suitable mate, which is unlikely at best, neither dragon is likely to possess the drive for procreation held by other creatures due to the nature of the Plane of Shadows and the effect it has on its denizens. From the moment of their creation, shadow dragons must fend for themselves in order to survive. They have no family due to the circumstances of their birth, the whole eating their siblings thing, and are simply too few in number to have any generalized relations with their own kind. Even those who began life as wormlings have never had shadow dragon families, their origins do not teach them a family or pack mentality. According to the Monstrous Manual from 2nd edition, shadow dragons of all ages have bodies and scales that are translucent, which causes the dragon to appear as a mass of shadows when viewed from a distance. Similarly, Monster Manual 2 from 1st edition describes the dragons as worm-like, that's W-O-R-M, dragons of lighter and darker shadows. With their bat-like wings and most of their body being semi-transparent, Someone trying to spot a shadow dragon may be able to see their eyes, two pools of feral gray opalescence, which are the easiest part of the dragon to detect. However, by the time someone who needs to spots the eyes, it is usually too late. From 3rd edition's Monsters of Faerun to 3.5e's Draconomicon and all updates in between, shadow dragons are described as having translucent scales and dark bodies, which give them an indistinct appearance and making them look like nothing but a foreboding mass of shadows from a distance. The Dragons of Kryn book from 3.5e is where most of the information on Shadow Dragons can be found, and is the first place that to mention the different origins of the dragons, causing them to have numerous descriptions. Despite their diverse backgrounds, most Shadow Dragons have similar physical characteristics. Wormlings and very young Shadow Dragons have grayish bodies and translucent scales that darken with each molt eventually gaining a dusky blue-black tint. Their scales are triangular and rigid, and scatter light rather than reflect it, which is partially responsible for their exceptional skill at hiding in darkness and shadow. Also, shadow dragons have slender, serpentine necks that allow them to search through rubble and foliage with little difficulty. My own personal opinion here is that maybe a shadow dragon scale mail could give advantage on stealth checks in dim light or darkness. If it's even possible to collect or make armor from the Shadow Dragon scales, I don't know, I'm not a smith. Ancient Shadow Dragons are often confused with Black Dragons because of the similar coloration, or mistakenly thought to be a Black Dragon crossbreed. 
though upon closer inspection the profiles of the two breeds are very different. And that trend continues in the 4th edition Draconomicon Chromatic Dragons, with Shadow Dragons appearing insubstantial, its dark hide and translucent scales help it blend into dim surroundings. Again, mentioning that Shadow Dragons are often confused with Black Dragons. The difference being that Shadow Dragons' heads feature rows of backwards pointing horns, a long fringe of spines emerging from the back of the dragon's neck, and its tail features a swimming fin. 5th edition's Shadow Dragons are exclusively dragons transformed by the Shadowfell's essence, whether born there and transformed, or uh, just transformed through exposure, as there is, no strict temp there is no strict stat block for Shadow Dragons, it is a template to add to other dragons. So the description is slightly different. A dragon's scales lose their luster and fade to a charcoal hue. Its wings become translucent, and its eyes pale to pools of opalescent gray. But otherwise, 5th edition Shadow Dragons look like the species of dragon they started as, so no physical change to the horns or the frills or the spines of the dragon. Consistently from 1st to 3rd edition, naturally born Shadow Dragons are among the smaller species of dragons, 3rd edition saying they are roughly equivalent to white dragons in size, being tiny creatures at Wormling and only reaching gargantuan at Worm age category, the second last age category in 3rd edition, and 2nd edition specifically listing them as 67 to 74 feet in length at Great Worm, compared to a Great Worm White Dragon, which is on average 85 to 94 feet in length, which is saying something considering how small White Dragons are among the Chromatics. In 1st edition, Shadow Dragon size ratios are as follows. 50% of Shadow Dragons are average, so right in the middle ground of that uh, length. 25% are small, all of which are female, and 25% are larger, and all of those are male. The 4th edition example Shadow Dragon is a natural born Shadow Dragon, but its size isn't mentioned beyond being the same size category as other Elder Dragons. So very similar to how 5th edition dragons are all the same size category, depending on their, their age, um, as opposed to earlier editions which were very specific about the actual size and differentiating the categories. Their bat-like wings seem to be more fragile than those of other dragons, but this is entirely due to their insubstantial and translucent appearance. In fact, dragons of an appropriate age and size can batter foes with their wings just as effectively as other true dragons. Similarly, their frilled tails are also deceptive in appearance, but are long and quite capable of dealing great harm, especially to those who write off the appendage as frail upon first glance. While most Shadow Dragons conform to the general appearance listed, there are some exceptions. The Chaos Shadow Dragon had neither claws nor scales, and in every aspect truly resembled a large shadow cast by a large dragon. The Shadow Dragon form of Daemon Grimwolf possessed characteristics of multiple other dragon types. Blue-black scales that shone faintly silver, the frills and horn of a red dragon, and the webbed claws of a white dragon. It is also noted that other Shadow Dragon variations have been recorded over the last few centuries on the world of Kryn, and this led some to speculate that the worms are somehow created from other types of dragons, and in this rare case, the speculation of the masses was correct. A majority of Shadow Dragons are nocturnal and often dwell in subterranean environments, or they can be found on planes of dimness such as the Shadowland, and Shadow Dragons found there can really have any activity cycle due to the lighting being preferable at all times. They cannot abide either very hot climbs or arctic conditions, but they thrive in cooler temperate regions. Shadow Dragons generally despise bright light, however they are quickly bored by lightless environments. Shadow Dragons find sunlight abhorrent, and they are weaker in bright light than they are in darkness. Shadow Dragons hate both bright light and total darkness, preferring variegated lightings with patches of diffuse light and deep inky shadows. So anywhere with lots of terrain where different shadows can be cast, or that have some access to a little bit of light and open space, but not too much would be preferable. 
Shadow dragons are treacherous monsters that prowl in the darkest corners of the Shadowfell, whether skulking in the depths of the plains underdark or commanding armies from the ruins of old cities infested with undead, shadow dragons are a dreadful force in this realm. They infest crumbling cities and sunken palaces. Some shadow dragons, such as the transformed daemon, prefer to layer in murky swamps, thick forests, and other natural shadow-filled areas. Adumbrant and other, quote, urban, end quote, shadow dragons may live in a city's sewers, nearby caverns, or abandoned buildings. When possible, shadow dragons that live in underground environments make their lairs near other predatory creatures, including their draconic cousins like the Hattori or Wyverns. While they share no love for these neighbors, the additional presence of such creatures often deters curious kender or adventuring folk from doing any unwanted exploring. Their partiality for layering in ancient ruins and similar underground locales only enhances their sinister reputations, as these environments perfectly suit their shadowy forms. On the world of Toril, shadow dragons that layer in the Underdark can be found on either the Middle Dark or the Lower Dark. Young adults can be found in the Middle Dark and Middle Dark Wilds, while adult shadow dragons can be found in the Lower Dark. However, they are most commonly encountered in the deepest reaches of the Lower Underdark, at least 10 miles below the surface, where the ties to the Plane of Shadow are the strongest. On the surface, they have been found from the Frost Hills to the Thunder Peaks. Their lairs always provide shadowy light for most of the day. They prefer ancient ruins where they can hide underground when the sun is bright and still find shadows above ground during dawn and twilight. In the Plain of Shadow, they live in dense thickets of trees and branches, fortified castles, or labyrinthine caves. In either plane, they prefer to locate their lairs near colonies of creatures that can alert them to potential foes or victims. The dragons seldom cooperate with these allies, however, though the dragons commonly prey on them. Shadow dragon petitioners, which are dead shadow dragon spirits, tend to favor the subterranean region known as the Cave of Greed, which is Tiamat's realm in Dragon Eyrie, or was. On the world of Toril, or where the Forgotten Realms is set, Chalson, the city of Worm Shadows, was at one point ruled by the Shadow Dragons of Clan Jazred. In the Year of Shambling Shadows, negative 221 DR, the clan conquered the drow city of Chalson and enslaved the populace, slowly eradicating the drow population over the following centuries by twisting them into creatures of shadow and supplanting them with their own worm spawned offering, at the same time drawing the city further and further into the Plain of Shadows. The rest of Chalson's history is not important to this video, but there is a decent amount more I could cover in the future. When it comes to a Shadow Dragon's lair, one trap Shadow Dragons will typically employ are Shadow Essence Darts, a mechanical trap with a location-based trigger, such as a pressure plate, that must be manually reset after each use. This trap shoots a poison dart that is coated in Shadow Essence. The dart itself has a plus 18 to hit in 3.5e, where dart traps had to make attack rolls, and the Shadow Essence requires a difficulty check of 17 of a fortitude saving throw, or causes one strength drain, which remains until cured by a restoration, and 2d6 strength damage, which is regained at the rate of one hit point per day, or two points if the character takes bed rest for the day. Or that can also be cured by a restoration spell. What makes this trap particularly effective is that it can target multiple creatures in a 10-foot square, hitting with 1d8 darts per target. The trap itself has a search and disable DC of 19, and the market price for one of these traps is 26,000 gold pieces, which really speaks to exactly how deadly this thing can be. The Horde of a Shadow Dragon is comparable in size to other true dragons according to 3.5e, listing Shadow Dragons as triple standard for treasure, just like other chromatic and metallic dragons. Monster Manual 2 from 1st edition says a Horde is typically of 10 to 80 gems of opaque substance and dark hue, black being preferred. 
Shadow Dragons prize items connected with shadows and darkness, and will destroy magic items which deal with fire and or light. In 2nd edition, Shadow Dragons love dark-colored opaque gems, and especially prize black stones. They also collect magical items to turn areas filled with total darkness or light into masses of shadow. Now for their psychology and mentality. Regardless of a Shadow Dragon's respective origins, they are self-serving creatures and tend towards sly and selfish behaviors. They are greedy and rapacious, even for dragons, and hungry for power and wealth. Shadow Dragons are instinctively cunning, sly, devious, and not prone to taking risks. Their propensity for devious behavior often equals that of their forest-dwelling green cousins. Their intellect and cunning exceeds that of most true dragons, but it makes them overconfident in regard to their own plans. They often possess qualities indicative of specific dragon types. Uh, the military mindset of blues, the belligerence, which is aggressive warlike behavior, of reds, or the nobility of gold dragons. Though many of them feel a need to engage in various acts of intrigue and deception. Some Shadow Dragons, specifically those on Kryn, as stated in Dragons of Kryn 3.5e, but it may not exclusively be them, feel a connection to the other races of Kryn and explore these mysterious ties. The dragon Adumbrant was thought to be an example of such a dragon. Although his motives were unclear, he served the ruling council of Merwick for years, in the guise of elderly astrologer Victor Charoskoro, no clue if I'm saying that right, without any deception aside from keeping his true nature a secret. The Shadow Dragon Adumbrant is currently the only one of his kind to assume humanoid form, but where there is one such being, there are almost certainly others. Damon's brief existence as a Shadow Dragon may provide insight into how the nature of a creature may change over the years. His human demeanor and desires remain strong after his transformation, but as weeks passed, his draconic nature began to assert itself. Damon made his lair within the Dragon Overlord Sable's domain, and slowly began expanding his territory. He began to crave treasure for its own sake, despite his own internal protestations and he began seeking a direct confrontation with Sable. He retained enough of himself to seek his lost love and to search for a way to return to human form, but after scarcely a year of life as a Shadow Dragon, he was on his way to becoming truly draconic. If more Shadow Dragons originated from other beings, they may possess buried memories of their past lives. Dragons transformed into Shadow Dragons seem to retain their memories normally, but their behavior may change at a similar rate as daemons did, such as adjusting to nocturnal life, avoiding sunlight, and maybe becoming more cunning. As far as I'm aware, Daemon is the only non-dragon to have been transformed into a Shadow Dragon. Shadow Dragons are very rare creatures, according to 1st and 2nd edition, most commonly found alone, which 75% of them anyways, but very rarely one may be encountered with a mate, which is a 25% chance, or incredibly rarely, a clan. And 3rd and 3.5e specifically list the possible groupings as Wormling to Young Adult can be sol found solitarily or in a clutch of 2 to 5. Adult through Great Worm Dragons uh, can be found solitary in a pair or a family, which is 1 to 2 adult to great worm dragons and two to five offspring which would be anyone younger than that mated pairs of shadow dragons are likely to act in concert with one another's plots and schemes though they may pick opposing sides of an argument or situation in which case they seek support from other dragons dragon kin or even mortals and no one wants to be caught in the middle of an argument between two shadow dragons trust me it is not a good position to be in when it comes to religion and worship, Shadow Dragons are often pragmatic creatures concerned with their own interests and agendas above all others. Some follow a live-and-let-live philosophy in the hopes that the gods will let them be so long as they don't act against any particular deity. Others may feign interest in particular faiths in order to gain information, but any such devotion usually passes the moment it becomes inconvenient. Now, that doesn't mean Shadow Dragons are not religious creatures. The Shadow Dragon Nercridian paid homage to Nuatari as her savior, and the power behind darker forms of magic. 
Whisper venerated Tachesis as the creator of evil dragon kind, even though he never truly considered himself to be one of her children. The Chaos Shadow Dragon, of course, worshipped its creator above all else, but as soon as Chaos's aspect was defeated by the lesser gods of Kryn, it fled to the Abyss and immediately began making its own plans. Over the years, individual Shadow Dragons have, of the world of Kryn have dedicated themselves to Hidukal, Gilin, Shinare, and even Mahere. Or Majere. I don't, I don't know if you pronounce the J in that. A few rare Kryn shadow worms believe the gods have abandoned them in some way. Daemon was believed to be one of them, as his chaos-descended form didn't allow him to hear the calls other dragons received during the Great Storm of 421 AC. In the Forgotten Realms, shadow dragons are among the favored creatures of Veyrune, drow god of drow males and thievery, among other things, and Shargrass, the orc deity of cold, uh, the dark, and the night. Mask, the deity of shadows, thieves, and formerly intrigue, was said to often send shadow dragons to aid his followers. Additionally, in the novel Prince of Lies from the Avatar series, two shadow dragons are guarding Mask's palace in his divine realm. E. Shaudao, the Chultan deity, often works his wills or shows his favor through the appearance or actions of shadow dragons, among other things. Shadow dragons tend to be somewhere in the range of evil alignment, being neutral evil in Advanced D&D 1st Edition, chaotic evil in Advanced D&D 2nd Edition, 3rd Edition, and 3.5e, just evil in 4th Edition, and 5th Edition doesn't specifically mention what alignment a shadow dragon is. The example dragon in the Monster Manual is a young red shadow dragon and lists them as chaotic evil, but red dragons are already chaotic evil in 5th edition. However, one specific example in 5th edition comes from Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. On level 18, we find the dragon Umbraxakar, who is specifically mentioned to have been a lawful good bronze dragon by the name of Gleister. But one of the listed changes to his statistics was the fact that he is now neutral evil. Now, minor spoilers for the adventure itself, if you want to avoid it, just mute until this spoiler symbol goes away. If Umbraxicar is turned back to normal by solving his despair, it says that his statistics return to that of an adult bronze dragon. So it seems that 5th edition has a transformed shadow dragon become some form of evil alignment, but not a specific evil. This lean towards evil alignment also hints at their social skills. Shadow dragons rarely get along with other races or other dragons. They often avoid both chromatic and metallic dragons unless there is a pressing need to interact with them. Shadow dragons know little or nothing about sea-dwelling dragons, interestingly enough, most likely due to their environments that they layer in, but it is said that they are likely to initially react to them with heavy suspicion. Kryn shadow dragons tend to recognize fire and frost dragons as powerful chaos spawn creatures, and will only attack them if they cannot outrun them, or if they have planned an escape route first. In most cases anyways, the chaos shadow dragon is said to be an exception. While shadow dragons feel no special connection to any of the draconic cousins, meaning those of tragonic blood that aren't true dragons, some will occasionally share stories and information with the crossbred Tylors. Shadow dragons sometimes treat Draconians and Dragonspawn as kindred spirits. Both of those races have unusual origins and are looking to make a place in the larger world. Most lizard folk react poorly to most shadow dragons and are avoided in turn, though one shadow dragon convinced a tribe of Bakali, which are crocodilian lizard folk, that it was a draconic aspect of death and it was worshipped for a time. Shadow dragons along with green dragons are the most likely to persuade wyverns to cause mischief. Some shadow dragons attempt to lure creatures from the mortal realm back to the Shadowfell to keep the dragon company, at least until they tire of their guests and devour them. Others are happy to leave the Shadowfell behind forever, understanding that treasure and power are easier to come by in the material plane. They are also likely to enslave other races to serve them as soldiers and servants. 
According to Dragons of Kryn, some prefer to form alliances with other evil dragons, while others may coerce Bakali, Draconians, or various dragonkin into serving them. Sometimes, according to 4th edition, Shadowfell dragons use servants for protection and as their spies and saboteurs, usually employing a variety of shadow creatures from dark ones to vicious undead thralls, but they prefer to enslave Shadar Kai whenever they can. Powerful Shadar Kai sometimes ride these dragons, which seems strange to me that an, an enslaved creature would ride the dragon, unless this is meant to imply that very strong Shadar Kai would work in tandem with a shadow dragon, or a dragon has a mage ride on its back like a mounted magical turret. One example encounter is one Elder Shadow Dragon, two Sorrow Sworn Soul Rippers, two Dread Wraiths, and five Bodak Reavers from 4th edition. So that is just a general clumping of different uh, creatures that might serve them as minions. But when it comes down to it, Shadow Dragons are more individualistic than other dragons. As such, their feelings towards any particular race are colored by the individual Shadow Dragon's origin and their history in dealing with such creatures. As mentioned earlier, they don't have familial ties with other dragons and have to make their own decisions about such things. The diets of Shadow Dragons vary with the individual dragon and often relate to the dragon's origin. In general, natural-born Shadow Dragons are said to eat almost anything, though their favorite food is rotting carrion. Often a Shadow Dragon kills for sport, but victims that are slain for food are left to decay until suitably foul. These dragons are equally fond of frost-killed, waterlogged, or salt-poisoned plants. The sinister Soul Chill sated her appetite as such with carrion and frost-killed plants. Some specific individual diets are documented, however. Nercridion was rumored to have eaten spells and enchanted items. The diet of Daemon Grimwolf in dragon form was said to be considered normal for a true dragon, according to Dragons of Crit 3.5e, so whether that means typical shadow dragon or typical chromatic and metallic is unclear, though Daemon often hunted the Bacali and Dark Knights that were sent after him. Though their diets often consist of physical prey, there are, of course, exceptions. The Chaos Shadow Dragon gains its sustenance from the emotional energies produced by its victims. Although it could live off the emotions produced by panicked animals and frightened mortals, it preferred to savor the despair and fear produced by other dragons. A truly refined palate. Now, I was going to write this off as an exception due to the nature of the Chaos Shadow Dragon, however, there is at least one other Shadow Dragon said to possess this type of physiology. The people of Naraka speak of a Shadow Dragon that releases its victims if they can produce an emotional tale involving the victim's family or loved ones, so this might be more common than it first, at first seems. Shadow Dragons rarely make use of their life-draining breath when hunting as it dulls the taste of their food. This is even true of those Shadow Dragons that feed off of emotional energy. They make wise use of their Dimension Door and Mirror Image spell-like abilities when hunting. The largest Shadow Dragons walk to the Grey, which is a plane comprising the three streams of the Ocean Chaos. The Plane of Shadow, the Astral Plane, and the Ethereal Plane, which is how they're all seen and documented by the denizens of Kryn. Or they walk to another part of Kryn when their local food supplies begin to run low, but are otherwise not concerned about their effects on the surrounding environment. Shadow Dragons are one of the varieties of dragons that can make dragon packs, mystical bargains made between sorcerers and powerful dragons in exchange for gold and a small portion of the sorcerer's magical power. In this case, the sacrifice of a spell slot. The dragon then grants the sorcerer access to one or more spell-like abilities. I'll detail dragon packs more in another video, but for now these are the abilities that Shadow Dragons can grant. The pact itself is called the Elusive Disciple of Dusk. For the cost of a second level spell slot, which means the sorcerer loses a second level spell slot, they get the op option to cast Expeditious Retreat twice per day. I won't list every one, but I'll list the specifics. A third level spell slot, you get Expeditious Retreat three times per day and non-detection once per day. 
going up to fifth uh, fifth level spell slot. Expeditious Retreat three times per day, Non-Detection three times per day, Dimension Door once per day, going to 7th level spell slot, Expeditious Retreat three times per day, Non-Detection three times per day, Dimension Door three times per day, and Shadow Walk once per day, and then a 9th level spell slot gains the Sorcerer Expeditious Retreat three times per day, Non-Detection three times per day, Dimension Door three times per day, Shadow Walk three times per day, and Inflict Critical Wounds once per day. The whole list will be on screen, but those were just the ones that specifically had new spells. Now for the fun part. Uh, usually in these videos, I would convert the stats of a Planar Dragon to 5th edition. However, since 5th edition already has a fairly good template, I will instead talk about all of the abilities, powers, and magic of the Shadow Dragons to show you just how powerful these creatures are and how they were depicted differently throughout the editions. Shadow Dragons have numerous abilities throughout the editions, some changing with the times and others being replaced entirely. For their armor class, in 1st and 2nd edition, Shadow Dragons have the same armor class as a Gold Dragon. In 3rd and 3.5e, Shadow Dragons have a higher armor class than even the Gold Dragons, specifically Shadow Dragons having a 46 compared to Gold Dragons with a 42 at the Great Worm age category. 4th edition also has Shadow Dragons with a higher armor class than Gold Dragons. And finally, the template for 5th edition doesn't change the base dragon. Uh, base dragon's armor class. Overall, fairly consistent for the earlier editions as gold dragon armor or higher. For their hit dice or hit points, shadow dragons in first edition always had a plus one to each hit die. However, they only had four to six hit dice at base, which we can compare to the white dragon's five to seven hit dice, which is saying something considering white dragons are among the weakest of chromatic dragons. In 2nd edition, they had the same number of hit dice as black or brass dragons, so more than white dragons at least this time. In 3.5e, they had the same health as a brass dragon over all age categories. 4th edition gave them a massive boost, making their hit points more than even the red dragon, which at elder age is more than an ancient gold dragon, making them have one of the highest hit point totals of 4th edition dragons. 5th edition doesn't change the base creature's hit points. For their movement, in 1st edition they are considered poor flyers and tire in a few turns. They prefer to walk. In 2nd edition, Shadow Dragons have the same flying speed as most other true dragons, but were classified as D rank flyers, which meant they were somewhat slow and couldn't fly less than half its speed without falling and had limited maneuverability. However, they did have twice the on foot movement speed of most dragons, which was one and a half times the movement speed of gold dragons, as well as a special jump speed. In 3rd edition, Shadow Dragons have the jump skill for free, which I guess counts for movement, and flying and walking was among standard for most of the dragons in 3rd edition and 3.5e. 4th edition additionally gives Shadow Dragons a swim speed equal to their walk speed, which is 10 squares or 50 feet, and 5th edition Shadow Dragons keep whatever movement speed they had from their specific species before being changed into Shadow Dragons. Strength. For the dragon's physical strength, we're skipping 1st and 2nd edition as they don't list strength scores specifically. In 3.5e, they start life equivalent to white dragons in strength, which isn't very good, but progressively they get worse, just barely trailing behind white dragons for the rest of the age categories. 4th edition shadow dragons are strange to compare because of how varied the other dragon's strength scores are, especially comparing the dragons of 4th edition to earlier editions, but they are a bit stronger than black dragons, but a bit weaker than blue dragons. 5th edition is of course the same as the base creature. Dexterity. For their dexterity, again we skip the earlier editions and jump to 3.5e. Shadow dragons have standard dexterity compared to most other dragons, giving them no bonus or deficit. 4th edition is incredibly weird for dexterity because all dragons are completely different from one another and even their earlier counterparts. Elder Shadow Dragons have a bit more dexterity than Elder Green Dragons, but less than Ancient Green, but far more than Elder and Ancient Gold, and more than even Ancient Red, which again is inconsistent compared to other editions, but let's just say they're in the top three for highest dexterity among the basic dragons of 4th edition, and let's just leave it there. 5th edition doesn't change the base creature's dexterity. 
Constitution, we're jumping to 3.5e again. Shadow Dragons in 3.5e have the same constitution as White Dragons across the board. And in 4th edition, they have the same constitution as Black Dragons. Intelligence is where it gets really interesting. Intelligence in 1st edition ranged from Very, which was an 11 to 12, to Genius, which is a 17 to 18. For reference, Green Dragons in 1st edition were average to very good, and Gold Dragons and Tiamat were classified as Genius, which is different from current editions as Green Dragons are now seen as smarter than Gold, but in most earlier editions that was not the case. Uh, however, you can see where uh, Shadow Dragons fall. Second edition also listed Shadow Dragons as Genius, which was equal to Gold Dragons. 3.5e has a similar comparison, making their intelligence equal to Gold Dragons a majority of the time, which for reference in 3.5e, Gold Dragons were smarter than all of the other traditional chromatic and metallic dragons. And they just had the top, and Shadow Dragons were very similar there. Fourth edition, again, is strange because of how inconsistent everything is, but the Elder Shadow Dragon places around the average for most ancient dragons. So it is very high average for the most part, but not the highest. Fifth edition, of course, gave no bonuses to intelligence. Wisdom. Second edition technically has morale, which is how a creature is ranked based on if they uh, persevere in the face of ad adversity or armed opposition. And considering wisdom is used in fifth edition to save against fear, I'll count this as wisdom. On a scale of 2 to 20, Shadow Dragons have a 16, which is considered champion level, and is equal to the high end of green and white dragons for morale, and equal to brass dragons. In 3.5e, Shadow Dragons were just barely behind gold dragons and began life less wise than silver dragons, but gradually surpassed them, which makes them one of the wisest dragons in 3.5e, at least the non-epic dragons. Again, 4th edition is random, but Shadow Dragons at the Elder category are just a little under gold and red dragons for wisdom. Do I really need to tell you what 5th edition didn't do? Charisma. In 3.5e, Shadow Dragons excel in charisma, being higher than all of the other base chromatic and metallic dragons, even just barely surpassing gold dragons in every age category. For its senses, in 1st edition, the visual capabilities of Shadow Dragons are inferior in bright light um, normal or equal to the average human standard in starlight, and they had the ultra-visual capability and very superior infravision infra out to 180 feet. 3.5e didn't mention any specific uh, traits that, a dragon, that the dragon's visual capabilities had that were different than other standard dragons. 4th edition, they had just notably dark vision, and that was it. 5th edition has brought back uh, their sensitivity to sunlight, so they have sunlight sensitivity, and dark vision and blind sight were the same as a standard young dragon for the example of the young red shadow dragon. For languages, shadow dragons in 1st edition could speak the tongue of all evil dragons and from 1 to 4 additional languages, which are based on the intelligence. Uh, 11 to 12 means 1 additional language, 13 to 14 is 2, so on, so on. In 2nd edition, they speak their own tongue and the evil dragon common language. Hatchling shadow dragons have a 17% chance of being able to speak with any intelligent creature, which doesn't really have an in-lore reason, but just roll with it. This ability uh, has an increase of 5% per age category to a maximum of 72% at Great Worm for this to work, meaning some Shadow Dragons may only ever speak their two Draconic languages. And there's nothing special for languages past those two editions. Everything else is either Draconic or Draconic in common. Uh, even 3rd edition doesn't mention anything specific other than what all dragons can typically do. For their experience and challenge rating, in 2nd edition, Shadow Dragons were worth the same experience as Black or Amethyst Dragons at Wormling, but ended up being as strong as Green Dragons at Great Worm, so a little bit better. Shadow Dragons in 3rd edition originally had a challenge rating ranging from 2 at Wormling to 23 at Great Worm, however this was updated later to be 3 at Wormling to 24 at Great Worm, which stayed as such all the way until 3.5e. For comparison, this is very close in progression to Green Dragons in 3.5e. 4th edition gave them 
a much higher level, making the Elder example a level 24 solo creature, making it tied for the strongest, as far as I could find, non-divine dragon tied with gold dragons, unless I missed another dragon of equivalent power. And 5th edition doesn't specifically list any bonus to challenge rating given from the template, but the young or the example of the young red shadow dragon is a challenge rating 13, three whole challenge ratings higher than the base young red dragon as a CR 10. Abilities. In 1st edition, all shadow dragons have the ability to hide in shadows as if they were a 10th level thief. Due to their nature, they could only be harmed by magic weapons. They are immune to life level loss of all types, and they cannot be subdued or sold. First edition Shadow Dragons also had 20% magic resistance, better than most dragons which only had the standard which meant none. Second edition Shadow Dragons were born with the ability to hide in shadows with a 40% chance of success, which increases 5% per age category to a maximum of 95% success chance. At the Great Horm age category, Shadow Dragons gain a unique ability, create shadows three times per day. This ability created a mass of leaping shadows with a radius of 100 yards, uh, the duration of which was one hour. All magical and normal light and dark darkness sources are negated for as long as they remain in the radius. Creatures able to hide in shadows can do so even if under direct observation. Shadow dragons and other creatures from the plane of shadows can move and attack normally while hiding in these shadows, effectively giving them improved invisibility. Uh, a successful dispel magic spell banishes the shadow. Third edition named their ability to hide in shadows Shadow Blend. They also gained a damage reduction from weapons and natural attacks rather than their first edition immunity, ranging from a five, a five reduction overcome by plus one magic weapons to Great Worms having a, a 20 point reduction only overcome by plus three weapons. And as per usual, their create shadow ability. Three times per day, a great worm shadow dragon can conjure a mass of leaping shadows with a radius of 100 yards and a duration of one hour. This is a creation effect. All normal and magical light sources are negated within this radius. All creatures, all characters and creatures gain a plus four bonus on their hide checks within the shadows and can hide even if directly observed. Shadow dragons and other creatures with ties to the plane of shadow gain total concealment while within the shadows, which is a 50% miss chance. Though they can move and attack normally, their attacks gain a plus two bonus and deny their opponents any dexterity bonus to armor class because they are considered invisible. Despite this being a Great Worm power, Soul Chill was able to use this ability while only being a mature adult. 3.5e updated their damage reduction to be overcome by magic weapons in general, regardless of the bonus. The natural weapons of young adult and older shadow dragons were considered magical for overcoming damage reduction, and the hide, jump, move, and move silently skills are considered class skills for the dragon in addition to already noted skills in the monster manual that all dragons have. And Dragons of Kryn gives them immunity to energy draining, paralysis, and sleep. 4th edition Shadow Dragons had the ability to at will create globes of darkness within, thir within 20 spaces of it that lasted until the end of the dragon's next turn. They were vulnerable to radiant damage in 4th edition, and taking radiant damage caused one of their globes of darkness to disappear prematurely. And they had Shadow Walk, which was at will movement that allowed a Shadow Dragon that was within at least one square of a globe of darkness to teleport to any other globe of darkness within line of sight. It did have the, uh, it did have to end the movement within at least one square of that globe of darkness. Fifth edition was a template that could be applied to another dragon. This gave the dragon necrotic resistance, a doubled proficiency bonus to dexterity stealth checks, sunlight sensitivity for disadvantage on attack rolls and sight-based perception checks while in sunlight, and if a dragon's bite did additional acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison, that damage was changed to necrotic. However, I saved the best for last. The dragon has two abilities that can operate in 
shadows. Shadow stealth, while in dim light or darkness, the shadow can take the hide action as a bonus action, and living shadow, giving the dragon resistance to all damage except force, psychic, and radiant while in dim light or darkness. For their spell casting, Shadow Dragons in 1st edition of an intelligence of 17 to 18 were able to use illusionist spells of 3rd to 4th level. Two spells per level attained from adult age. So an adult sh Shadow Dragon with 17 to 18 intelligence would have two illusionist spells of 1st level, and an Ancient Dragon with 18 intelligence would have two spells each of 1st to 4th levels based on the number of age categories in 1st edition. Now, this, if, if you're thinking along my lines, that doesn't make much sense, uh, saying a dragon with an intelligence of 17 to 18 would be able to use an illusionist spells of 3rd to 4th level, but only, but then the example of an adult shadow dragon with 17, 18 would have two illusion spells of first level. So that doesn't make sense, but we're just going to roll with it. Regardless of the level or school of magic, the shadow, the spells a shadow dragon uses will not be those of light or fire due to their aversion to such nature. A shadow dragon in second edition uses its spells and magical abilities at sixth level plus whatever applicable combat modifier. As of second edition, shadow dragons gain specific spells. Uh, and powers as they age. Juvenile had mirror image three times per day, which was 1d4 plus 1 images. Adult gained dimension door twice per day. Old gained non-detection three times per day. And Venerable gained shadow walk once per day. Third edition dragons have a caster level of 1 at Wormling and a caster level of 17 at Great Worm. They can also cast cleric spells from the chaos, evil, and trickery domains as arcane spells. Their spell-like abilities, included at the maximum age category, 3 per day mirror image and non-detection, twice per day dimension door, and once per day shadow walk. Their breath weapon. The breath weapon of a shadow dragon has changed throughout the editions, but stayed fairly consistent for the first few editions. In first edition, the breath weapon was a cloud of darkness, 40 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 20 feet tall, that blinded anyone in the cloud, even those with infravisual capabilities, and lowered their life energy to 25% of their usual level or hit dice, and 50% if they succeeded a save. And this would last for a number of rounds equal to the dragon's age category. However, if a spellcaster lost levels and forgot spells, they would not regain those spells unless they relearned or regained them in the usual ways for their class, such as study or prayer. And of course, a shadow dragon was immune to all of this. Second edition has the same size for the breath weapon. Creatures in the cloud were only blinded for one round, and it had the same reductions of reducing them uh, by three quarters on a fail or half on a save. This lasted for a number of rounds that the dragon rolls from 1d4 plus 1 at hatchling uh, and 6d4 plus 2 rounds as a great worm. Negative plane protection spells prevented this energy loss. A character reduced to zero or fewer levels by this breath lapses into a coma for the duration of the cloud's effect. And once again, they were immune to energy draining. On to 3rd edition, the Shadow Dragon's breath weapon is a cone, the size of which is based on age, of billowing smoky shadows with an energy drain effect. Creatures within the cone gain a number of negative levels that was shown on the Shadow Dragon table, which was uh, 1 negative level at Wormling and all the way up to 8 negative levels at Great Worm. A successful reflex save reduced the number of negative levels by half, rounded down. After 24 hours, if a negative level isn't removed, the creature can make a fortitude save for each negative level. On a save, the creature removes the negative level. On a fail, the negative level goes away, but the character loses a level permanently. In this edition, it was mentioned that repeated usage of a Shadow Dragon's life-draining breath weapon stains its fangs and claws to a dark gray coloration. 4th edition changed the breath weapon to an area of necrotic damage that caused the target to lose one of its healing surges and made them weakened until they succeeded on a saving throw. We weakened creatures dealt half damage on attacks that required a, an attack roll. 
As an after effect, any target hit by this breath had the resistance to necrotic damage negated until the end of the encounter. On a miss, the breath weapon did half damage and the target didn't lose a healing surge, but nothing's mentioned about those secondary effects, so... In 5th edition, a dragon that is transformed into a shadow dragon has any damage dealing breath weapon. It has changed to necrotic damage, and a humanoid reduced to 0 hit points by this damage dies, and an undead shadow rises from its corpse and acts immediately after the dragon in initiative. The shadow is fully under the shadow dragon's control. A few interesting things that might be semantics, but I'm going to say them anyway. The damage die and number of die do not change. Um, and are not mentioned at all, when a breath weapon becomes necrotic damage. Also, the saving throw isn't mentioned to change, so theoretically a green shadow dragon would still use constitution for the saving throw. The template specifically mentions damage dealing breath weapons as well, so dragons with a second non-damaging breath weapon, like the metallics for example, retain their second breath weapon which makes metallic shadow dragons, I feel, so much worse to deal with. The last thing for the dragons specifically is their battle tactics. First edition, um, normal clawing and biting attacks typically followed a shadow dragon's breath weapon. In second edition, shadow dragons are said to prefer to attack from hiding, usually employing invisibility or just hiding in the shadows. They use illusion and phantasm spells to confuse and misdirect their foes and older Shadow Dragons are especially fond of their non-detection ability. 3rd edition and 3.5e tells us similar things, saying Shadow Dragons prefer to attack from hiding using their Shadow Blend ability, as well as using illusion spells to confuse and misdirect their foes. So, fairly consistent there. 4th edition continues to keep it consistent. A Shadow Dragon never fights fair, it lurks in darkness, biding its time for the proper moment to strike. A Shadow Dragon may even follow its quarry for hours before revealing itself. When it does strike, it drops globes of darkness, then uses Shadow Walk to move into the best position for its breath weapon, preferably using it on the same turn with the 4th edition action point system. While its foes struggle against the necrotic power of its breath, the dragon tears into them with fangs and claws, creating additional globes of darkness to help it teleport around the battlefield. When a dragon in 5th edition becomes a shadow dragon, it retains its statistics except for what I previously mentioned. Additionally, a dragon that has layer actions might retain or lose any or all of its layer actions or inherit new ones, probably due to the fact that when a shadow dragon is transformed by the Shadowfell's energy, it either stays in the Shadowfell or relocates to a more appropriate layer for its new form. Either way, the dragon's layer will probably change in location and nature, thus having it lose layer actions or gain new ones. Now, there is a subspecies of Shadow Dragon called the Drow Dragon, but I'll make a separate video on them because there is a good bit of interesting lore there, and a few different types of them. Anyways, that is it. After far too much research, a very long video, and many close calls for me in the Shadowfell, that is a complete guide to Shadow Dragons. If you stuck through this, thank you so much for watching all the way through. If you've enjoyed this, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe for more Dungeons & Dragons videos. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!